Loveline is meant for an adult audience. Loveline may contain sexually oriented content. Listener discretion is advised. Loveline starts now. And it is Loveline. Again, that number is 1-800-LOVE-191. Very exciting evening today. Yeah. Why don't you introduce our guest? Oh, I don't know. A little guy who started off his career in the space rock band Hawkwind many years ago, but you probably know him best for the close to 35 years as the only static member of a band called Motorhead. The image of his silhouette holding that, that Rickenbacker bass, that alone is enough to push yours up my spine. I'm of, I'm of course talking about the man sitting right next to me, musical icon Lemmy. Uh, you romantic fool. <laughs> Man's the modern Jesus. Yeah. Well, to be honest, he's fucking Jesus Christ. Motorhead is my life. Without Lemmy, they'd be like Motorhead, there'd be no Metallica, no Megadeth, no Slayer, nothing. There wouldn't be any of the heavy metal we have today. Rock and roll, he's Lemmy. Lemmy, he's rock and roll. Rock, rock and roll. roll. Hey, babe, don't act so scared. All I want is a special care. If I hear Motorhead, um, I will bang the whole time. <laughs> Lemmy is... God. They drop a nuclear bomb on this planet. Lemmy and cockroaches yeah, is all that's going to survive. Move over for a damage case. Everybody, it's Loveline Lemmy from Motorhead in the house. Mike Catherwood paying homage. You know it. Current CD is called Motorizer. It came out last year as the 24th CD for Motorhead. Amazing. Yeah, it amazed me, all right. <laughs> <coughs> 35 Lemmy, years ago, when you get the band started, do you think you'd be 25 albums in? You don't think like that. You think two years. You know, I mean, you just want to play with a couple of guys. You know, that's all it is. And then it goes on and on. <laughs> and on. Yeah. Is it true that over 2,000 women you've betted? No, that was actually the magazine printed that. I said 1,000. Yeah, that's still pretty impressive. Not really. I've never been married, and I've been, you know, I'm, I'm 63. Yeah. Work it out. It's not many a year. <laughs> I yeah. like how he thinks. Let's go to calls. Jason's calling from Canada. Lenny, it's an honor to be talking to you, a true legend. Thank and you. Uh, I have two quick questions for you. Basically... I'd like to know what are your musical influences today, and the other question is, is a uh, favorite place to play a gig? Well, I don't really mind where we play as long as they go hooray, you know? I think it's cool that you're still rocking today. Keep up the good work. Well, I will, because don't forget, I'm not qualified to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> the other question was, uh, what are your uh, musical influences? Yeah, <laughs> he the, anticipates the, that one. Your influences are the same. You know, when you're my age, is when you were 20, the first things you hear that really knock you out stick with you, you know, you're never going to hear any music better than that. So it was Little Richard, The Beatles, Elvis, you know, all that, all that good old stuff, you know. Where were you, Lemmy, when you heard that stuff? Well, the first time I saw The Beatles, they hadn't made a record yet. Saw you them. saw them? I saw them at the cabin in Liverpool, yeah. What was that like? Well, it, was, it was magic, like they were magic, you know. Did you think, oh my God, this is going to be the greatest rock band of all time, or this? Yeah, is kind of. Crazy. I did because, it, like, we used to get these girls would come down. I lived in this holiday resort place in North Wales, and you get these girls from Liverpool would come down, and every year it was this singer called Billy Fury. They were all crazy about him, and then one year it all changed. It was this Beatles thing, you know. So we hitchhiked up to Liverpool and see what they were like, and they were. Monstrous, they were like perfect, you know. Everybody thinks the Stones were the hard men and the Beatles were the sissies, and it's really opposite. The Beatles uh -huh. were from Liverpool and the Stones were from the London suburbs, you know. Going to art school and shit, you know, so it, like, it wasn't that way at all. And the Beatles I always thought were the best band in the world, you know. We well, had the Beatles in my mind box. But I knew you were going to say that. Okay, sorry. Did you find that? The owner, the owner uh, gave it to you hers. 
Do I have to go? Yeah, I'll come over right here. 46.7. Trump take American Express. Oh, yeah. So, Abuja? Yeah. Where's the lady that gave me that coffee? I know. Thank you very much. No, I know. I, I was like, all right. I got a good one. Great. Yeah, yeah. I think you're really good. Yeah, exactly. The original of the whole the original thing. Original idea. A couple yeah. of them, like, I mean, Charge of Pepper is something. So yeah. I think you really like it. And I know Thank we you. can have a lot of stuff. Thanks, really. The Sunset Strip has seen a whole lot of different movements and genres and, and musical versions of the same thing, basically. You know, we had a bunch of different musical movements. And, and uh, first of all, Motorhead is one of those bands that transcends movements. Like, it doesn't matter what's happening in the, in the community, in the rock culture, Motorhead is still hailed as, as being, like, king. When he moved to L.A., became part of the scene, he was already embraced. It was just basically his throne was waiting for him. Sound of speeding. Two cameras, eh, Mark? Hey, Action. Lem, someone yeah. I want you to meet. Hank Moody, the writer. Obviously he's not from LA, and it, but it's really interesting to see like how much of a staple Emmy has become, especially in Hollywood. He's become a, a Los Angeles icon, you know? Cut. Cut, I don't know if he does fit in LA. LA's so fucked up, you know? But he doesn't really fit. I think Hollywood has to fit him. Now all we have to do now is do that another 147 times and we go. A lot of people are LA bashers, you know? It's like, uh, especially people from up north in San Francisco, you know, that kind of thing. Like, oh, that's LA, La La Land, or whatever they call it. And, you know, it's just a land of, uh, you know, pretentious people and all that kind of thing. There's a real weight to this town. There's a real history to it. I think it's got a lot more balls than a lot of big cities, frankly. Lemmy looks like an L.A. rocker to me. I mean, he's just got that thing about him. He's got the part that's combination biker, musician, or, you know, guy that works at the car wash. You know, he's got that, he's got that old school L.A. look. He doesn't change it, and I don't think it was created, you know. And that's what the good part of L.A. is. It's the people that don't try to be. Yeah, I was in bands when I was a little kid. and then started. I kind of I came to California to do that. I got out here and I, this cat I knew wanted me to come to an acting class. So I went. And uh, next thing you know, I was in some theater group and I didn't know anything about it. I realized that I was making a little bit of money doing this acting, you know, and so I stuck with it. And uh, started playing music. Did you some that most as well? Yeah. Yeah. I made $500,000 on my support. When the movie came out, and then that's just up front there. And when the movie came out, it was successful. It made about, I don't know, $34, $35 million, and it made for $3 million, right? One day I'm sitting at the house, and uh, my assistant comes in and says, you just got a check uh, in the mail. I looked at it, it's for a couple of million dollars. Yeah, I went and bought a, I went and bought a case of Bud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Another case of Bud. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Metallica recorded four of our songs, and I got a check for like 100 grand. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's pretty good too. I haven't got to the million yet, but you know, I'm working my way that's up. That's pretty good. My first favorite was Buddy Holly, and then Little Richard, you know? Oh, yeah. No, those little, guys. Little Richard, such an outrageous voice. Oh, yeah, yeah. The best vocal ever in rock and roll. I worked with him one time on a TV show. He was there, and he pulls up in an old uh, Cadillac, and all these guys get out in suits and everything, you know, and had a hope. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, he, he met my son. My, my son at the time was only like three or four, you know. And little Richard goes, oh, hey, baby. Yes, well, I, I, and I told my kid, I go, hey, Willie. Excuse me. I said, hey, Willie, listen, it's okay to talk to this cat, but don't sit on his lap. <laughs> Lemmy's like a fucking radioactive cowboy. Hard rock Johnny Cash. A biker. World War II chic. <laughs> He's Black Bart meets Mad Max. He's Captain Hook. A little bit of cowboy, a little bit of metal, 
a little bit of rock and roll. He would be the perfect description of like my dream dude for sure. <laughs> Lemmy's look is something that is probably a little bit cultivated from back in the 50s and then added to that some of the sort of shit that he picked up along the way, you know, his bikers, punk rock, whatever. Um, although he's been around for a long time, so, was, you know, maybe he had some of the punk stuff they got from him. Describing Lemmy style is not that easy because, you know, from boot to boot, it always changes substantially. He's got a very distinctive and good aesthetic sense. He actually will bring me drawings of what he wants. If I was to really give it a, a specific name, you know, I would probably say it's like a Western Jack boot because he likes these boots with like a squared off nose, like almost military looking, almost like a cavalry kind of boots, you know, with, you know, motorhead flair to it, of course. We were at a rehearsal place in the Valley, this is back in the mid 90s, and Motorhead was right next door to us rehearsing for a tour. Every day we would see Lemmy out at this video game in, in the, this lobby area, and, he, and it was summertime, and it was really hot in the Valley, and Lemmy was wearing these shorts. Now, if I tell you, He's wearing Daisy Dukes. It was like a thong, dude. You would walk out of our door, and the first thing you would see when you'd walk out of our room was Lemmy bent over this machine. So it's basically Lemmy bending over it with his ass in, in your face. It was a, that's a weird scene. And we're all wearing shorts, but our shorts are, you know, like board shorts. Finally, you know, I got the balls to walk up to him, and, and he's just playing the game, and I'm like, hey man, hey Scott, how are you? And I'm like, hey, you know, we just all been wondering. He's like, what's that? And I said, what's the deal with the shorts? Like, seriously. And I'm like thinking, like, I'm afraid. Is he going to punch me? Like, what's going to happen here? And, and he's like, what? What do you mean? And I said, they're really short. Like, what's it, like we see your ass every day. It's kind of weird. And he goes, what? It's hot out. These are shorts. And he, like, kind of steps back. He looks at me and goes, those aren't shorts. Those are pants. These are shorts. I'm cool. And it just kind of goes like this, like, like it made absolute sense. It's so bad, baby, I don't care. What anyone thinks, what anyone cares, it doesn't matter. It's just let me, you either take him or you fucking don't. And he don't give a flying shit whether you do or not. There's, there's no words. It, it's just, he's Lemmy. I mean, it's almost... It should be a verb. <laughs> Nobody told him to do anything that he wasn't completely natural and comfortable doing. And that's rare, man. And that's why I think we respond with respect, because um, we want to be like that. I think he's a renegade, you know? There's not that many of them anymore. Everybody assimilates, you know? Go along to get along, you know? To get what they need to get. And... I don't see Lemmy as that kind of guy. I see Lemmy as doing things his way to get where he wants to go. And that's attractive because people don't do that anymore. The thing I remember about Lemmy, which is, you know, nothing to do with music, is he was obsessed, and I think he still is, with one-armed bandits. You know, the, the you know? And um, I can remember Ding Wars, a little club in London, very, very popular by the canal. I think that's probably the first time I ever met him. You walked into Ding Wars, and just inside the door was the one-armed bandit, and without fail, he would be on that. And sometimes all night, you know. I don't know if he ever won, but God, he would play that thing for hours. He loved it. I've never seen anybody uh, love those things so much. They should bring out a mower-haired one-armed bandit, you know. And if you get three lemmies, you win the jackpot, you know. Shaking all over.
Because when it comes to rock and roll, you need something to believe in, you know? Like, integrity means everything. Musically, of course, when you go and you see a band and you know it's coming from the heart, it touches you even more because there's some sort of human connection. If you go up and see some robots just moving around the stage, it's, you might as well go home and play a video game or something. But when someone, when someone is doing... When someone's playing rock and roll from the heart and they really walk it like they talk it, you pay more attention because it makes, it makes you feel like a human being in a way. Like to connect to someone, um, someone doing something really honest or really true, um, it's important. And so to me, to me more than any other rock musician, I consider Lemmy a legend, you know. But to me, more than any other rock musician, he is the baddest motherfucker in the world. One of those lyric sheets? When it gets to the instrumentals, there's yeah. two 12 bars in a row. Okay. So Dave, let's just check the levels here for a moment with Lemmy, make sure that he can hear himself. Yeah, it's a double chorus, you know? Double. Fuck! No! For Christ's sake! What was Chuck Berry thinking? Chuck. I remember a show in, in England that I did with Meatloaf where the whole show was held up because Chuck Berry thought he hadn't been paid when his agent had been paid. Yeah. It wouldn't go on until he had a wad of, of money. He'd been fucked so many times, you know? In the 50s, you know, there was no rules at all. Yeah. You know, a guy would pull a gun and say, I'm not paying you, what are you going to do? Oh, even in the 60s and the late 60s, Hendrix got burned fucking blind, you know. Yeah. I mean, he never saw any of the money. I was fucking standing outside of LAX once, getting ready to get on a plane. And this young black guy comes up to me and he says, Hey, I read in an interview that, uh, that the only person that you ever want to meet is Little Richard. And I'd always said that. Like, I don't give too. a fuck about anyone else. It's Little Richard, you know? Yeah. I said, Little Richard. And he goes, yeah, he's my dad. I said, shut Not the really? fuck, really? And he goes, yeah, he goes, come here. And there's this limo parked out front. <laughs> and he goes, and the window comes down like, and this fucking little Richard is sitting right there. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. And he goes, hey, Dad. Oh, shit. He goes, this guy. was He's like, what? He said, this guy is a musician. And he goes, oh. And the fucking window comes down and goes, God bless you. How, How, you How weird must it have been to be gay and black in Macon, Georgia <laughs> in the I 50s? An amazing singer. The best rock and roll singer ever. I don't know who people consider the originator of rock and roll. That's who I think it's Little he Richard. Because nobody does. else had the fuck. He was crazy. Him, you know? Elvis, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis, That's it. Too. Those, those three. Yeah. You can't tell who did the first whatever, but, like, between them, they started rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. When you meet the originals, you realize, like, oh, they're, f you know, of course they're fucking, of course right. they're troubadours or renegades. They're fucking freaks. Yeah, they've been they're renegades they're all totally their lives, you know. Right. Yeah. They don't know how to do nothing else but be a renegade. Right. So that's where you got all of the, the music that was 
different than anything else, like right. Little Richard, fucking yeah. a gay black dude making Georgia in yeah. the 50s. What was he going to do? There was nothing he could do but play rock and roll. Nothing to be a boxer, is he? <laughs> Probably <Yeah>. not. <laughs> People say, don't you like Prince back in the 70s, you know, 80s? I said, no, I've seen Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. <laughs> well, he comes on with scarves all over him with the Stratocaster, you know, are you kidding? I, I used to score for Mitch, I used to score dope for him. And I used to score acid for Hendrix. He was a very fair man, you know, I'd give him ten trips and he'd give me three and take seven. Very generous. You know, but you had to take him then on the spot. <laughs> he would take seven. Ah. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is with acid tea, they say it doesn't work two days in a row, but we found out if you double the dose, it does. <laughs> it does. I'm not going away for a while. I'll call you when I get back. Yeah, dude, let's go have a drink. I haven't been in the rainbow in ages. I had this fight going on with the fucking darkness, this <laughs> band, right? Oh, well, that's why I fucking called you, because I was sitting there. We went to the show, and the show was fun, you know. So we went up to the rainbow, and we're sitting there, and the singer, I'm sitting at a table talking to the singer, and he says, he says, hey, you recorded a song with uh, Lemmy, right? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, we kind of have a little feud going with him right now. I was like, really? Why? And he said, well, he reviewed our record and he said it was fucking shit or whatever. Was a and it, right, and I, and I said, I'm like, oh, have you ever met him? He said, no. Because I don't think you'd met him before, had you? He said, no. I'm like, oh, dude, he's the fucking greatest guy. I mean, he's really good. Yeah, well, you know, so I called him a fucking cunt or something in the press. I'm like, oh, he, you know, he's, yeah, honestly, he's a really, he's a good dude. You'd, you'd like him. And, I, and then I said, yeah, I'm going to go take a piss. And I fucking got my cell phone. I'm like, Lem, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Come on up for a drink. Ah. So, so I got that all the darkness to send down there. He sees you coming, it was just like, oh fuck me, no, no. <laughs> and then Lemmy sat down and and at first I'm like, hey Lem, what's going on? He's like, oh, you know, just I wanted to go down to the darkness gig, but they banned me from the show. And I'm like, and I said, oh, have you met Justin, the singer? Well, I talked to him for about what, half an hour that night? Yeah. And he didn't change my opinion one bit. <laughs> 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 Rainbow Barn Grill is the most famous restaurant bar where musicians and hanger honors and groupies, it's sort of like a, the place to go hunt and the place to die at the same time. It's a rocker place. If you're a rock and roller, you come to the Rainbow. If you're not, don't come here. For me, anyway, Lemmy became synonymous with the rainbow because anytime you would go there, there he is playing the trivia machine. And it literally became a joke. Like, let's go to the rainbow and have a drink and, and say hi to Lemmy, like jokingly, and then and Lemmy's there. You get so many tourists that come in, especially in the summertime. You know, they write, is Lemmy hang here? Is Lemmy here? If he's not here, he's on tour. <laughs> he's got to be one of two places, the rainbow or on tour. Just give Lemmy that game, a Jack and Coke, and a cigarette, and he's there forever. When people come in here and they'll go on the game and they'll go, it says Lemmy up there. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's Lemmy from Motorhead. No, you can't believe it. It's like the middle of the afternoon. Then all of a sudden, it's, here's Lemmy sitting there in the bar. I've seen everything from like chicks like welling up to the frat guy 
Oh my god! The, it's the best when they start crying, though. It's just so cute. Anyone that wants a picture, he'll take one. You know, anybody that wants to talk to him, he'll talk to him. But you gotta let him play his mega touch first. It would just be sitting there, playing it, some sort of uh, weird heavy metal meditation. <laughs> Mixed with Jack and Coke and something else that we won't disclose, you know. I was a house painter for about three weeks. Working for this old gay guy called Mr. Brown Sword. How's that? It is true too. Mr. Fucking Brown Sword. <laughs> it doesn't come any better than that. Monty Python couldn't do better than that. Luckily, he fancied my mate, not me, so I got to paint the upstairs while he was attacking Colin downstairs, you know. It's funny as shit. I worked at the riding stables in the summer. I worked on the fair in the summer when the fair came round. What else did I do? I worked in a factory for a while, but that was fucking terrible. I grew my hair till they fired me. We had the beach and the sea and the horses, you know, so it was great. I had a pretty good childhood, you know, I ain't complaining. So they fucking ruined it and put the school in there, you know. I'd heard before that Lemmy went to school here, um, but I'd heard a load of rumours about it first, and then I went and checked on the internet and found out it was true. I heard Lemmy got expelled from this school. And for what reason? Uh, apparently he was playing his guitar down the tannoy, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. I don't even know if he wanted to be a rock star or anything. I think it just came naturally, because that, that's how he seems. He just seems like pure rock. If you like to gamble, I tell you I'm your man. You win some, lose some, it's all the same to me. <laughs> the ace of spades, the ace of spades. I saw the Vickers at the Oasis in Manchester and I thought they were excellent, so I, I went and asked for a job with them, you know. Chatting up the ladies, tickling the fancy, pouring out your charms to me. We'd be on with the Kinks, the Who, the Hollies. We played at South Pier Blackpool with the Who and all the audience were chanting, we want the Vickers, and Roger Daltrey didn't like that. They were a damn good band. Uh, and compare a, very favorably with any of the bands that I had were, you know, bigger heads like the Who and the Kinks and Manfred Mann and all those people. At the time, they were about as big in the north as the Kinks were in the south, like, you know. Uh, but, you know, we just tore all around the north of England, really. We couldn't even get arrested in London. North of Birmingham, we were big stars. This is 1965-6, we were on 200 pound a week each clear. That's like 4,000 a week each now. And we all had jags and we had a speedboat for Christ's sake. We used to go water skiing on Windermere. It was rock and roll with a bit of thump, very aggressive. And he would actually go up to his amplifier and feed his guitar back and he would make him scream. So when I first joined the Vickers, they were ambitious. They settled into this routine of doing the same gigs every year, you know, the circuit. And they became, in the end, in fact, a cabaret show, you know. So it wasn't for me, really. He wants to be in the thick of it in London, like, you know. And we didn't. <laughs> What I really like, you know, about the, the Lemmy mythology is that he used to uh, uh, be a roadie for Jimi Hendrix, too, which scores a lot of points in my book, man. He would rather play an instrument than carry it. Uh, and so that kind of gives you the idea. <laughs> I think just as a as a resume piece, you know, defining, you know, what is a rocker, you know, I mean, to his core. You know, uh, the kind of guy said, if I can't be in the band, I'll carry their equipment. He hung out with musicians and he just did it continually until people let him play. And he's, he's really come up the hard way. <laughs> Go away, Greg. <laughs> 
he said one of the most amazing one-liners I've ever heard in my life to me, and he explained it. He said, I remember before there was rock and roll. I said, wow, that's a, that's a wild thing to say. I said, what do you mean? And I'm not going to try and imitate his voice. He said, I remember when there's only Rosemary Clooney records. He goes, I remember before there was rock and roll. There was just like your mom's records. He said, and I, I think I'm paraphrasing. He said, I, said, I think he said something like, then we heard Elvis and we never turned back. He said, we heard rock and roll and we said, that's us. In the 60s, how I got albums, I had to go down, and singles too, I had to go down to the electrical appliance shop and he would order it for me from whatever company, you know. And this is purely as a, he wasn't licensed to do it or nothing, it's just a friendly basis, you know. And he'd order them for me, and like three weeks later, they'd come, right, come back, you know. A Buddy Holly record called Wishing, and a Buddy Holly record called Learning the Game. Eddie Cochran, two, three steps ahead, and I was aware of that, and something else. And these kids, without knowing it, when they listen to Motorhead, they're getting Johnny Cash, they're getting Chuck Berry, they're getting Eddie Cochran. It was the same thing with the, the original punk rock guys. They were very influenced by that music. A lot of times, the fans don't know that, but when they're listening to Ace of Spades, they're listening to Eddie Cochran. That's Lem's influence. Well, I showed the weeping willow how to cry. And I showed the clouds how to cover of the clear blue sky. And the head just it's like, it's like what we did when we were teenagers and why we played music in the first place. We're playing the songs that got us into it. The music is so real and so like unpretentious that people can't help but like it. The genesis of Headcat was someone wanted me to do one track for an Elvis tribute record. I know Lamb loves Elvis and Johnny Ramone. So I thought, what would be cooler to get John and Lem on the same record? So we went in and we did the song, John went home, and we had all the studio time left because we did it so quickly. It was just for fun, you know. We all knew all the same songs by heart, so we said we should do an album, you know. So we did. This apartment is like a fucking museum. It is a museum, really. I've seen museums with less shit in them than I got. It's uh, one of those things, you know, this was like available and it was near the rainbow, you know, which was the only point of reference in LA I had, you know, because all I've ever done is come stay at the Park Sunset or wherever it was and come up to the rainbow, you know, which is what we used to do. There you go, he's pretty cool, isn't he? Really? That's the Metal Hammer Award, two of them. This is a porcelain model of me done by somebody and given to me on the road. It's pretty interesting shit, you know, you gotta give them some great stuff. But the platinum album is from Joan Jett and the gold one is from um, Lita Ford because I wrote a song on that album. That's from the Wacken Festival in Germany and this is my clan, the Scottish clan Fraser. And this is my annual membership in the Rangers. There's my action figure. You've got to keep it in the original box, see? Then one day it will be worth as much as $5. Silver and gold record for Ace of Spades. This is from Hammersmith, Odeon. This is uh, from No Sleep to Hammersmith stuff. And this is uh, by a German cat. It's really good too, huh? I wish I hadn't dropped it, you know, that's the only thing. Why not move? Well, for one thing, I'm never going to get a place like for the money I'm paying here. I mean, I've got a place that's rent controlled. They can't put it more than 6% a year, yeah? So I'm still only paying 900 bucks a block from Sunset, you know. I'm never going to get a deal like that. And I'd want to live around here because I like it around here, you know. What's your most cherished possession in here? My son. Because oh. he's the only one I got. I mean, I have another one, but I've never seen him, so he don't count. Neither have I, no. No, neither of us, no. You well, his, his mother went and found him two years ago. She said he's like five foot tall, he's just like me. And uh, 
he's a computer fucking programmer or something. Really? Does, does so he she said, he, you know, she, she's a social worker, right? And she's put on a bit of weight, so she wears these, like, paisley smock things, you know what I mean? Like, and she said he put his head in his hand when she told him she was his mother. She said he hadn't got the heart to tell him who his father was. <laughs> Pull him out in the balcony with a fucking pistol, you know what I mean? <laughs> I well, you can't want them all, can you? Where would you put them? Yeah, but I mean, I don't know, I just like stuff. I've always liked stuff. Stuff is what happens, you know. In your life, you get stuff. Then you lose some stuff and you keep some stuff. Mm. And at the end, you leave it to some other poor bastard to be saddled with it the rest of their lives, you know. Don't worry, kid, you'll love, you love all this shit soon enough. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, really, I've no doubt, yeah. I'd rather have you than all that stuff. I know, yeah. I, don't, I can never imagine why that is. Why people would rather have some gobsmack human, you know, instead of a load of money. Right. I never understood that. Well, money doesn't, you know, love you back, does it? You I can spend you, it, but it doesn't love you, you, you back. You can imagine it does. Well, I know that you met your dad when you were six. Um, mm. I met him too. Yeah, we met each other at the same time, yeah, actually. Simultaneous, it was. Funny how that happens. Like two ships meeting in the cosmos, man. It's like a memory that's all fray <coughs> frayed around the edges and all sepia toned. Sepia, see? Actually, sepia. I was sepia then. Yeah. I was almost see through, in fact. Yeah. I just remember tugging at these slim legs in jeans. That was me, you see. And that was him. But I was very small, so I just saw the legs. Describe uh, what happened. Um, I was... I don't really remember what... It was a dope deal. I was waiting for some hash to arrive or something, and the, this, I was in the kitchen making a piece of toast, and this small blonde child came in and... You're my dad, I'm your son, and my mum's in the other room. I looked around, there's bloody <laughs> Tracy sitting there, babbling like an idiot as usual. I don't know how he got there, because, like, she she wasn't in no dope deal because she didn't do drugs, right? So why was she there? Well, my mum went How looking. did she get in there? Well, she went looking for you, I know that. Oh. And that's because I, when I was about four, um, I was, you know, in, like, a kindergarten, right? Right. And there was this, there was this other kid that came up to me, and he said... Uh, I've got a daddy and a mummy. And I was like, well, I've only got a mummy, right? But he said, he said, you must have a daddy because everybody has a daddy and a mummy. So I went home and I said, where's my daddy? Where's my you, daddy you then? You bitch. And, uh, and, and I got this look like, oh yeah, we don't talk about him in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think after that, you know, endeavors were made to introduce us to each other. Ah, you know, I didn't want to live with his mother, you see. Because it was only like casual sex, really, you know. But I, I mean, I, I love Paul. I mean, I like Tracy. She's she's great, and she did a really good job bringing him up, you know, up to a point. And he's he's turned out to be a really clever kid, you know. And he's good. He's a great musician, you know. You have no idea how good he is, you know. My mum knew the Beatles, right? Oh yeah, she used to go out with John Lennon, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. She, she, uh, Obviously, she, trying to get to Paul McCartney through him. Well, no, she, she lost her virginity to John Lennon. Yeah, right. The story that I've been told by my mum was that um, George liked her. Oh. And, and he would shyly, coyly look at her when she'd walk past the bus stop and George yeah. would be standing there and she'd... And she, speak. She wasn't interested in, in George. Right. And then, um, you know, but I don't know. I mean, maybe if she had been interested in George, it would have lasted longer than with John. <laughs> Never know. It didn't last longer with John, did it? No. But she always talked about it. She was very smitten. She but I think, smitten but she called John. you after Paul, not John. So, you know. Yeah, that's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah, she must have been thinking about Paul when she was with John, perhaps. Well, I, perhaps I, she called him Paul, and that's why it didn't last. About some oh, I love you, jo I love you, Paul. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, Paul. No, we swapped girlfriends twice, didn't we? Yeah, we did. At the limelight, and then at the, at the uh, Stringfellas, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we swapped girlfriends one one night and then did it again about two months later. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, a lot of chicks like that, you know, the old man and the son as well. Yeah. Must be like it's like, it's like screwing the daughter and the mother at the same time. It's like that, yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah.
Doesn't it ever feel too cluttered for you? Yeah, all the time. What do you think? What are you doing? Shooting my trash can? Fuck off, man. You better not put that in the Where's fucking Where's the trash room. can? Huh? Where's the trash can? Yeah. He's shooting the table. Oh. He's shooting the table. I didn't see that. I was looking at that. Hmm. At what? I don't know. Whatever that is. Uh, you could offload some. It's a fucking Domino's bargain list. <laughs> One of my favorite memories of my dad was when I was six years old. And I was... I'd just learned to play, like, three or four chords. He came to visit, and as he was leaving, he, uh, he picked up one of the other guitars, and he started just playing by the front door, like, you know, E major. And, and he, we just jammed on that one chord for about 20 minutes. And, it, and he was just, you know, like, looking right into my face, you know, like, right into my eyes and just, just, just egging me on, you know, like, this is the rhythm, this is, this is the feel, this is how you do it. Yeah, yeah. Probably the third time I'd ever seen him, or something like that, and so that was a major event in my life. The nicest thing he ever said to me was very recently when he said to you, and you asked him what is the most precious thing in this room, and he said, you know, my son. And uh, I, was, I was kind of blown away by that. I wasn't expecting that that response. You know, I, I mean, you know, it was, it was, I wasn't thinking he would say that, but you know, that was like amazing. It was wonderful. Thank you. This is my son, Paul. Hey, not bad for an only child. But take a turn, Scott. <laughs> Some size. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I present this tank. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that bad? Yeah. I served several years in the U.S. Army uh, as a special operations soldier, uh, both in Ranger Regiment and Special Forces, and I have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I know Lemmy's a big military history buff. That was kind of my rock and roll uh, connective tissue to the military, was probably m Motorhead. Uh, you know, I I'd, I'd, would wear Motorhead t-shirts you know, over there, in a way, kind of <laughs> stating my own individuality, not to uh, uh, glorify war or say, yeah, war's really cool or whatever. It is what it is. It's a it's a function of the human condition. But Motorhead is a it's good it's good go to war music. As most people might know, he's a World War One and World War Two historian. 1916 was their first Grammy nomination record that was about World War One and he's a collector in, in uh, I would say world, well just war memorabilia in, in general. I remember watching a BBC uh, documentary with him and he's over here showing me this airplane that uh, Messerschmitt or something, I'm trying to remember what it was and he's going that's, that, that, that's wrong. I go, Lem, it's a documentary, he must have researched this shit. Brings out three different books to show me that that plane wasn't even built then. Everybody collects something, right? Drummer in my old band used to collect elephants. There's elephants all over his fucking apartment. I think I my collection's at more interest. <laughs> so we've got the Damascus sword. See the blade? That's Damascus steel. So we've got the first model dagger. Quite pretty, I think. Purely decorational. These are Masonic daggers. Look at that. It's huh? a nice piece too. This is from Toledo, not Ohio. Look at this freaking thing. 
is that? British. That's British. I think it's from the first war. The, and this is a German bayonet. That's in action. I always liked the workmanship and the designs, you know. They're the last great knife makers, you know, the last great sword makers. It's a craft in Germany that uh, has largely disappeared now, you know. Even a lot of the American swords were made in Germany. In the Civil War, there was a lot of German swords used in that war. And then um, up to the First World War, obviously, you know. I got Argentinian stuff, I got Yugoslav, I got Croat, Slovakian. And how long has it taken you to, to mass this collection that you have? Is it years and years, right? 19 years, yeah. When I came over to the States, I had nothing. You know. So there we are, come on. Dress up for yeah, you look good. Good afternoon. See you on Tuesday. Good to meet you. I'm Jim. Scott, nice Scott. to meet you. Steve, how are you doing? Hey. We put all that and you check it out. The MP40, it's a G43, yeah, K98. That's a, nice gun, uh, that's a 251 9. Chassis of a 222, isn't it? Uh, 251. 251. There's the head, sir. What was this chassis? A 38T. 38T, right. a check, check chassis. Yeah, yeah. check one. Right. Skoda. Right. So. Did you have to uh, restore it? Yeah, it's got the. Uh, it's got a, an original engine in it. There you go. Over there on that side. Well, this is actually the smallest tank that the Germans made. It was made actually in Czechoslovakia, based on a Skoda design from before the war. And this was called a Hetzer, 38T chassis. It was a tank killer. This is a big gun for the tank this size. This is 75 millimeter armor piercing gun, you know. This would stop anything, more or less. They buried this tank in the ground, right? So the, all would be visible would be this here. Right, just the gun on the top of the tank, you know. So they just sit there and wait for you to come along and just kill you. <laughs> Wars are the most interesting times. It shows the best and the worst in people. A war, you know, you get to find out who your real friends are. Ask any of those boys coming back from Iraq, you know. Anybody who's watching this film and thinks that you're a Nazi, what do you want to say to them? Well, I've had six black girlfriends so far, so I'm one of the worst Nazis you ever met, right? Imagine going to Nuremberg and introducing my girlfriend to the Fuhrer, you know, like, yeah, I don't think so. I just dress how I like to dress, you know. Um, I don't ask anybody else to do it, you know. It's a free country, supposedly. I've often said if the Israeli army had the best uniforms, I'd collect them, but they don't, you know. So there you go, you know, I can't help it. It's, it's ridiculous to think that I could be in this. I'm about as far from it as you can get. Fire! <laughs> How was that, Larry? <laughs> that was great. I think we're really ahead of the time. I worship Hoffman. You know, that's some genius music. They were kind of like a prog rock group that, that punks were allowed to like. It 
dangerous kind of rock and roll. It's not choreographed, it's not safe, it's not cliched, it's not, you know, you never know what you're going to see, to be quite honest. And that's got to be good, isn't it, you know? We're a space rock band, so, I mean, a lot of the music we, we play was around science fiction stories, which we'd sort of interpret and put into music, so we're pretty heavy rock band with uh, nice flowing electronics. People thought we were some sort of hippie fucking flower people, it fucking wasn't true, man, we were like a black nightmare, man. We used to lock the doors so people couldn't get out. <laughs> it was a psychedelic experience, and nobody was doing that sort of thing, really. We just used to have, used to get this sort of trancey beat going, this trancey rhythm, and a strobe going, you know, and it's like, it didn't drive you insane, it just put you into a trance, really. It's quite odd, as New Order. Um, the driving sound that Hawkwind had, the very pulsy, percussive keyboard sounds, you know, we, we would actually listen to that and try and emulate it, you know, in songs like Temptation and Everything's Gone Green. We actually did try and rip off Altman. And they represented the first sort of counterculture, you know, with IT and Oz magazine. And, and that was, was all very coming romantic. up. And it was a wonderful time to grow up to be a kid. Yeah. But mostly I remember standing at the front drooling at Stacia. <laughs> the girl with you the breasts out. Or the girl with her breasts out, which was incredible for a 12 or 13 year old. You know what I mean? It was like our education. We were a bunch of misfits, basically. It was like a family. Yeah, it was like a family. And we had a huge following, you know, we just because we do any gig, and we do a gig in London, it would be like a drug dealer's convention. And Dick Mick and uh, Lemmy were sort of always into a lot of speed and grumpy. Dick Mick was always grumpy because they'd been up for a few days and we'd get picked up in our van and he'd be all grumpy and Lemmy would be all surly and get him slammed at all and sit down, you know. We were in the States touring and we were in Niles, Michigan, on the way to Detroit. I don't know where Niles is, it's on the other side of Michigan from where Detroit is. So uh, we pulled over at a, a roadhouse to eat. And I wasn't hungry, you know, being a speed freak. So I just got this new camera. So I went out prowling around looking for things to, you know, yeah, I was with the new camera. And um, I got conked over the head in this abandoned housing project and fucking came round without my camera, without any money. I go back to the roadhouse and they're gone. And dump me there, you know. I mean, what kind of shit is that? You know, one of your band members is missing after you have a meal and you just drive off. <laughs> That's not the way I work, you know. And uh, so now I'm stuck here, so I have to hitchhike across Michigan. I go up to my room, crash out for about two hours, down the sound check, do the show, crossing into Canada the next day. I get busted for speed, in jail for two days in Canada, handcuffed to a fucking iron bar. And uh, they, then I get the news as I'm going into Essex County Jail with overalls over my arm, going into the delousing section. This voice behind me says, you're a bail kill, mister. So I, ah, oh, thank you, you know. Flown to Toronto immediately, do the show, four o'clock in the morning, fired. Apparently they only got me out of jail because my replacement couldn't make it in time. I found Lemmy in certain ways hard, quite hard to work with because we were in a band where everybody was taking different drugs. So you had this sort of disparity between people of where they were and, you know, what sort of wavelength they were on. You know, I was into sort of psychedelics myself and pot and mad mushrooms and peyote and all that sort of thing, pretty calm stuff, you know. And um, I think Lemmy was more into amphetamines. He used to hang the band up because he was never on time to leave in the morning where we had to get up and catch a flight somewhere and we'll all be downstairs waiting to go and Christ, you know, where is he? You know, I'll have to go upstairs and he'd be still in bed, you know, you'd shake, come on, let me, for Christ's sake. And it did cause a lot of stress within the band, all of us, you know, all of us got pissed off over it. It wasn't, you know, just one or two. We did get pissed off over it. And then he got uh, busted at the border sort of thing, which seemed to seemingly, when you were on tour, with all the stress factors, it's like the last straw, you know what I mean? And it was decided the majority, uh, you know, the band said, no, enough's enough, and that was it. When I arrived at the gig, and I said, you know, where the fuck's Lemmy? And they said, uh, this other guy, uh, Paul Rudolph, was taking his place at the exact Lemmy, and I, I mean, I was devastated, but I'm the type of person who, uh, I, t I keep a lot inside, 
So, um, I think I just carried on, but I was devastated. It was quite a sad thing, actually. Very sad. I mean, he was very upset over it. And, uh, well, we all were, really. We just came on for a long time. Because it, it, what it was was 70s drug snobbery, you know. Like, they were all just doing organic drugs, man, you know. And I was doing speed and organic drugs, so I didn't like that, you know. You hated uh, us for it all, really, at the time. Well, you would do, wouldn't you, you know? He described me as um, sanctimonious, self-righteous arsehole at some point, and I thought, oh, well, that's all right. That's what he thinks of me. I went home and screwed three of their old ladies. <laughs> you know, well, you know, vengeance is sweet, saith the Lord, you know. And uh, I must admit, I was banging one of them already <laughs> before we left, but it was a great time. I wouldn't have traded it for any other band, ever, you know. In fact, I would have probably been in that band that right now if they hadn't fired me. But they are. And it was quite good for him, because look where he is now, so... <laughs> How long have I been on the road? Yeah. 19 years. 19 years? Yeah. Give or take a year. I mean, isn't it boring after a while? Uh, no. Why is there so much violence on the road? Why do you break things in hotel oh, rooms? I mean, it's a violence. Oh. I mean, when you start... When you start doing oh, things... fucking violence! Oh. <laughs> I don't know what you mean about violence, <laughs> huh? You don't want to see some violence, baby. Don't break it on me! Don't break it on me! No! Fuck me! No, how long have you cut it? Run through an interview! Yeah, man, do it too late. You're killed by another one. Lemmy was at the beginning of heavy metal, you know, maybe even pre-Black Sabbath. If they'd said to me, uh, who would you say was the original metal band? That's, you know, not me. I mean, it was, I tossed between Lemmy and Black Sabbath, but I would say Lemmy and Motorhead. They took elements of what existed as heavy metal, mixed it with punk, and created this frantic, intense, powerful music form that you know went on to define heavy metal as we know it. It was just brash in your face. It was like getting socked by an overhand right. You know, it was like Mike Tyson in his prime. I remember you turned the radio on and it was like really, really rancid disco, bad boy band pop music. You know, the Osmonds, stuff like that. And um, you go and see a motorhead show and it's completely different. The silver tongue devil, the demon lich. I know just what I'm doing. I like a little innocent bitch. You know, I could not believe that this, that there was a guy singing like that on a record and people were digging it. It's like, whoa. I mean, one of the headlines we had, the worst band in the world, you know, but it was in big letters. Well, I mean, it was fucking great. You know, because I didn't give a fuck. Well, you, can't, you kind of care to a point, but, you know, but, but the kids were turning up, you know. I want to see the worst band in the world, you know. They must be great. <laughs> Motorhead was speed music and free people on speed. Consistency of energy could be contributed to that and our slim figures. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody just tried to be that heavy after that. Nobody's achieved it. We fancied ourselves, Guns N' Roses did, like, if we could ever be even close to as heavy as Motorhead, we'd be successful. Back when I was young, in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, we were very punk rock, you know, and I had you know, my, my little shelf of my, my old rock records I bought as a kid, Steve Miller, Aerosmith, uh, Led Zeppelin, all these bands I used to go see. And then punk rock happened, then I saw The Clash and The Ramones, and my life was changing, and all of a sudden, that's the old in with the new. And you'd see someone with long hair, like, well, he's a hippie, I can't listen to that music, as Johnny Rotten says that. This. <laughs> and then someone would pull out the Ace of Spades record, and you're like, oh, well, wait a minute, because this kind of goes against the gospel of the punk rock, because they're long hairs and it's metal, but you put the record on and go, damn, man. I can't help it. I'm a Motorhead fan. Well,
It was their look, it was their attitude, it was their music. You felt by listening to their records that they didn't fit in. You felt that. And when you didn't fit in yourself, there was that instant fucking lightning bolt connection like, oh shit, they're one of us, they're us. Personally, that this tour is an antidote to Simon Cowell and all the evil shit music that he's purveying. And if there's one man on this tour that embodies the spirit of rock and roll more than Lemmy, show him to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the great man himself, Lemmy! The band uh, split up and um, Brian James went off and did uh, other stuff and uh, we thought, well, could we possibly have a band without Brian? We thought, oh, we need someone who can really play bass. So we asked Lemmy and uh, he instantly said yes, he would, uh, he would do some gigs with us. As a laugh, me and Scaby said, yeah, let's see if he'll play SOS by ABBA. And, you know, so, uh, we thought there's no way in the world. We just did it as a joke. And then we said, yeah, I'll give that a go. And he played it. He played a whole bunch of damn songs. And we did one of his, one Motorhead song, and we fucking ruined it. Yeah, he wasn't pleased about that. He said, I learned all your fucking shitty songs and you ruined my one. One fucking song, you bunch of cunts. <laughs> Killed by death. Metropolis. Overkill. I don't believe a word. Some people might be like, killed by death, that's stupid. I'm like, no, you're stupid. Lemmy is an amazing lyricist. Powerful lyricist. Smart, sharp. The first lyrics are just so twisted, just straight in your face. Don't talk to me, I don't believe a word. But that's the way I like it. Maybe I don't want to live forever. I mean, who can say it better? You know, I mean, that that is one of the most prolific lines. You win some, you lose some. It's all the same to me. I kind of live by that. Fuck Keith Richards. Fuck all those dudes that fucking, you know, that survived the 60s and are fucking flying around on Lear jets and, you know, living up their gunslinger reputation as they you know, fuck supermodels and the most expensive hotel in Paris. It's like, you know what Lemmy's doing? Lemmy's probably drinking Jack and Cokes and writing another record. Two, Two three, four. four. One of the lyrics that Lemmy wrote for me was, was Mama, I'm coming home. It's, it's really a, a haunting feeling because it's like when I give someone who doesn't know what the situation with my wife and I it really is, um, it's kind of spooky when somebody writes a lyric and you sing that lyric and you go, fuck, you know, it's so close to home, you know. Every time I play that on stage, it's, it's like I get a chill up my spine, you know. Just a clown in a one-horse town in a broke-down second-hand car. Can you still get it up? Or are we pushing too hard? I think if you ever had a beautiful girl, you had to use your MasterCard. Nah. Let's go again. Can you still get it up? Or are we pushing too hard? Then you want to get your hands on the beautiful girl. You gotta use a MasterCard. Let's listen to what we have, okay? Yeah. They're pills. Ooh. <laughs> what kind of pills are they? <laughs> Vitamins? No. No. Diabetes. And um, one for blood pressure, I think. I mean, I told him my blood's pressing just fine. Every time I cut myself, it comes right out. OK, that's it. We 
were sitting around talking and he asked me about a quad injury. I had torn my quad like maybe a year before that and he just out of nowhere said, uh, you know, when you tore your quad, did you think that was it? We, you, you know, did you think your career was over? Were you finished? And uh, I said, you know, I went through my head a few times and, you know, but I just kept going with it. And he said, you know, when they told me I was diabetic and, you know, and I got, I was really sick with it, which was actually right before he did my song. He said, uh, you know, at first I thought, I'm done. You know what I mean? It's it's all over. And, and uh, but then, he, you know, he, he said, uh, I, I started thinking about it and, you know, the fuck am I going to do? You know, he said, I've lived my whole life this way. I've done everything I've done up until now to get to where I'm at. I'm not going to change. And the, the, the quote that always sticks with me, he said, you know, I do all the stuff that I do drug wise and drinking wise and all that stuff. And at the end of the day, he said, you know, I'm, I'm too old to find God now. Sorry, man. to do a couple of songs with him in the studio. He came in there with a, a bottle of Maker's Mark whiskey, and I started drinking with him. And we really didn't get much done because we were just drinking, and, and he was like playing guitar and showing me stuff, and then we'd stop, drink, 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 drink. And the next day, I had to go to the hospital. Lemmy gave me alcohol poisoning, basically. There's the Marlboro Reds, there's the Jack Daniels, there's the Speed, there's the Strippers, and there's the Gambling. You know, that's what he liked. I remember me sitting down and with Zach, and he's showing us, like, Beatle footage and stuff, and uh, he, he says, uh, do you want a Jack Daniels? And me and Zach, oh, far out, you know? So I remember, I remember this. He, he takes out a fifth of Jack Daniels and cracks the seal and then ha hands it to me, and then so I take a swig off it and hand it to Zach, and... Zach takes a swig of it, and then he goes to hand it back to Lemmy, and Lemmy is opening another fifth for me and opening another fifth for him. Like, he, it was like having a beer with the guy. He wanted us to drink the whole fifth, just like, you know, we're drinking a beer. We're like, holy shit, no, no, no. First time I ever met the guy, says hello, and proceeds to offer me crystal meth. This is a fucking hardcore dude. I will say this, I've never, ever, ever seen Lemmy incapacitated by, by booze or anything. I have not seen him f fall off the stage. I haven't seen him say stupid things. I haven't seen his life crumble because of it. It would be pretty scary <laughs> have Lemmy completely sober and on you, man. By, by the law of average, he should have been dead. Like, I mean, we all used to hit it really hard, but he's just... I don't know, he's made of fucking iron. I don't know what the fucking... No, I don't really want to advertise all that. I don't want kids to take any drugs because of me. You know, I don't really want them to stay off drugs because of me either, but I don't want to advertise the lifestyle that killed a lot of my friends. OK? Here's another question for Lemmy. Jose? Uh, yeah, um, Lemmy? Yeah. Um, what do you credit to your longevity? You drink, you smoke, you party a lot, and um, I want to know what you credit to it. Not dying. That's the secret. <laughs> That's the secret of survival, not dying. I don't know, you know, I was lucky, right, because a lot of my friends didn't make it, you know? Yeah. And uh, I did. You know, I, I never did heroin, see. That's, that was the one. I never saw anybody die on anything else. When I was about 17 years old, uh, he said to me, Son, promise me that when you grow up, you know, don't do coke. Please, just don't do coke. And I was like, okay, you know. And he says, just do speed, it's much better for you. <laughs> when you think back on it, Motorhead was the original thrash band. About everything about them, they played fast, it was gnarly, it was a little loose. It had some punk rock, it had metal, it had all the elements that we then later perfected and refined and then we became part of, you know, the big four of thrash metal. You could definitely say without Motorhead, there's no Metallica, there's no Anthrax, there's no Megadeth, probably no Slayer. There could have been, those bands would have been like uh, Anthrax Light or something.
I mean, it influenced me big time as a bass player, big, big, big time, because of the levels of distortion, the speed of it all, like the power of it all, and the relentlessness of it. I can't even begin to say how much of an influence Motorhead have been on us. I mean, and, and it's like, you know, on a, a bunch of different levels. Uh, I'll give you a list of things that were lifted from Lemmy. Musical level. Singing style, you know, lyric phrasing, you know, the simplicity, the rhyming scheme of it all. Attitude. Trying to be as cool as Lemmy. Motivation, pers perseverance, uh, the look. I mean, his facial hair in the early days for me was certainly all about that. I mean, the bullet belts, come on. But Lemmy, to me, is not just an inspiration, but I think he's kind of like the okay sign, you know? It's okay to go this far. It's okay to do this. And it's like he's, he's kicked the door open for a lot of bands that were feeling like they wanted more. Only way to feel the dark. <laughs> I can't sing that way. I'm like the opposite. Uh, I can sing down here. You like the low? Yeah. You take the high mic and I'll take the low mic. Hello, sir. Hey, Great to see you, brother. Good to see you, too. Hey, man. Hey, what's happening? Well, hey, how you doing, bro? What's happening? Good. Uh, what do you want to do? You want to do, I'll do the oh, first right, one, you do the second one? Yeah. Do the third one together or something? Sure. Or a line each or what? You do the high harmony? No, <laughs> not, not anymore, no. <laughs> Balls and you go, ah! no, no, yeah, no, that's the theory, yeah. No. <laughs> what ending do you have for damage case? Like How do you end stop and then I stop and then and then you're the last. This is how we we'll get there. <laughs> how? Don't that, be under that, any right illusion there. that we know what we're doing. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah. Let's have fun with it. It's a three count. It goes one. It time to go home yet? I didn't think so. You can see there's an extra amp up on, on stage here. We have the distinct pleasure of inviting on stage with us one of our all-time idols, and I know the reason that Lars is so into music. Right? He followed him around, pestered him forever. I think he even threw up on him. Something like that. <laughs> Lars is the biggest Motorhead fan on the planet, all right? And here is the godfather of heavy metal from Motorhead, the one and only Let Me Kill Mr. Okay. 
Lemmy and the boys for a decade or whatever, and I wound up doing a show with them. And well, surprise, surprise, same dudes are on the crew as when I toured with them back in the early 80s. And here it is, the 90s, and they're like, Hey, DA, doing? I'm like, Holy crap, you know, but this is Lemmy. It was just like a big family kind of thing without getting too cliche. We rely on each other. We love each other, we hate each other, we love to hate each other. We've done a tour, we've gone home, come back. The first time you see him again, everybody's like, oh, you know, it just feels tight. There's not that band crew thing with uh, this lot, it's just friends. It's just fucking great. What other job in the world can you get paid for traveling around the world, meeting great fucking amazing people and seeing Motorhead every night. Oh, 
the little fuck up. Yeah, you're older now. What I've seen in rock and roll bands that I've been in, you know, the money comes into play and then the attitudes change. You fucking want to act like a rock star. Motorhead doesn't do that. Motorhead isn't in that. You know, Motorhead's in it for the music. Motorhead's in it for the fans. We still have a goal, you know, to, to move this band forward and to sound the best and, 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 and to be able to, you know, write good records. There's no faking going on here, you know? I used to say, there's not a fake bone in, in Lem's body, and, and, and that, that really is true, you know? And I can say the same for Phil and, and myself as well, that we, we're not faking us through year after year, you know, pretending or, 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 or so. And, and I think that is reflecting out, you know? It, it's like a, an aura around us, I suppose. We've had quite a few people tell us that uh, our music got them through particularly low times in their lives, you know. It does something to us when we play, you know. For some reason, it's, it's great. I don't know what it is we do, the magic thing, but it uh, gives you a good feeling, and it's, I guess it's the same for the fans, like. Love the vibrato. <laughs> I asked him for his autograph when I was 12 years old, folks. 12 years old, he came to my hometown when he was with Hawkwind and he was the only one that came out to sign autographs. If somebody said that night and had been a band with this guy here for a quarter of a century, like big rock band, you know, it was, he would have said, oh, come on. But it's a good story to tell because it's quite inspiring, you know, anything can happen. I've done a few gigs with, with Motorhead and gone to sound check with him. It's so fucking loud, you really can't do much. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of yelling going on. <laughs> One, two, three! That's perfect, just a bit more. An ear doctor will probably be amazed at just how well Lemmy can hear, considering the uh, abuse he gives his ears. There's one thing about Lemmy, he'll always hear you if you offer him a drink, even if you walk up behind him. We're the loudest band in the world, in the Guinness Book of Records. You know, that's what people want. They want it loud. They want it loud, they want it fast, they want it... Lemmy. Is it loud enough? No! I remember when we went in to record um, Power, Corruption and Lies in Britannia Row in Islington in London and um, the, the people that had been in before us hadn't, you know you're supposed to level the desk when you leave you take the strip off and you level the desk, put it back to how it was. And they hadn't done it, presumably because it was late when they finished. And I said, well, they're rotten fuckers. I said, who was it? And he went, oh, it's Motorhead. And I was like, oh, fucking great. So we put my bass through his channels on the desk and it sounded shit. <laughs> When I think of Motorhead, I don't think subtlety. He makes me think of a door blown open. And his voice is, it's rasp, you know, it's like eating fucking nails. It's kind of like some, it's more like a wind coming at you. I had the impression that someone's coming up behind me and spanking, spanking me ears. Everything starts going grainy. That's it, it's like being in a sandstorm, basically, that's it, that's it. It's the oral equivalent of being in a sandstorm, I would say. When the lights go down and that motherfucker hits the stage and he blows a cigarette out of his mouth and just winds into the bass. It's game over, man. You can drag anybody to a Motorhead show and they're gonna go. Oh, 
Everything about Lemmy's playing sets him apart from other bass players and for that matter any other musicians now that I think about it. I think the, the biggest thing is the Rickenbacker and the Marshalls. That's that's the sound that I don't think anybody's ever I've ever heard anybody create uh, on bass. And he plays it a lot like some heavy metal guitar players play. He doesn't play guitar on bass, but it almost sounds like guitar. The basic difference is that most bass players sound like this. Whereas I... ...sound quite different. Sound. I didn't necessarily know it then. 
my bones, you know. What would you say, Tim? Sorry. How would you say my bass playing encompasses my personal uh, personality and my outlook on life generally in the modern 21st century already? Well, I think the phrase hammer and tongs comes to mind. Really? Yeah. Not a hammer, an anvil. An anvil and anvil tongs. Anvil and tongs yeah. and hammer. And hammer. And, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, very hard. Actually, he's never heard us like when we both. Oh, it's like the same, same time when we both do the same thing. thing like, because because you're talking about actually, you know, faces, he talks of one thing one, one minute and out the other. Out the and he, he, and nobody stuff. ever fucking understands the thing we say yeah, because, because we're we're actually we just uh, two geezers trying to get along backstage, you know? Yeah, and everything like that. And things like that. Yeah. Or, or something else. Americans usually have a nervous breakdown around now. <laughs> How do you know the CIA weren't involved in the Kennedy assassination? He's dead, isn't he? <laughs> How do you sell a death guy a frog? Do you want to buy a frog? <laughs> How do you make a dead baby float? Ow. Two scoops of ice cream, two scoops of dead baby. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe the life you've lived in the last 30 years in the rock circus? Controlled madness. But is it still as fun as it used to be to go around the world and play concerts? Yeah, it's great, you know, it's a great job, I recommend it. You know, it's almost as good as being a TV interview. <laughs> still a lot of movies backstage? You see any? But what, what makes you the proudest in your career? Survival, I think. Every year that goes by, I get a bit prouder, you know, because we proved that we weren't the trash band that they said we were originally. And every year we survive proves it a little bit more, you know. You know, like that, right? <laughs> what, what keeps you going? 30 years, what, what keeps you going and going? Well, see, uh, you have a dream when you're a kid. And my dream came true, so. Why stop it? How long are you planning to keep going? Oh, until um, 2047. <laughs> Then I might slow down a bit. Might be 2048, isn't it? <laughs> I love everything about Lemmy. The music, fucking everything. Like, there's nothing not to like about Motorhead. It's a band that's got it all. They're hardcore. They're proper, proper hardcore bands. They're like. I don't know, like Saxon and all that shit. They're like excellent. They're like they're full on. They've always been full on. Motorhead, are like they set a standard for all the others to follow. Every time you see them live, they make you deaf. I don't have to listen to my wife. <laughs> so many for about five days out of every year, my wife is totally ignored because I just oh sorry, darling, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Sorry, I just can't hear you. They made me stone deaf forever.
Is this all right? <laughs> it's the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. It's huge. I love that guy. He's so much nicer than I thought he would be. Why is that? No, he's really humble. I thought it would be like, yeah, I don't give a shit. But when I said, your music really means something to me, and he looks at me and says, thank you. That, yeah, it really means something to me. <laughs> you look at him, he's probably very intimidating, but this is one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. I mean, there's so many people that hit him for stuff, and, and you know, you just look at him, and most of the people in his position would not pay attention to half of these things, and this is a guy who go out of his way to help anybody. You just see it in his heart. When I was married before, right, and, and um, we were all on the road together, my husband was a huge, at the time, my husband Matthew, come from Indiana, like just redneck kid, idolized Lemmy, like huge Motorhead fan. So we were on tour with Motorhead, and and, um, and me and Lemmy have immediately have this connection. Me and my, my marriage was heavily on the rocks, and, you know, uh, Lemmy, what, like my husband just wouldn't talk to him or, you know, anything. And Lemmy just would come up with T-shirts and like, hey, Matt, you know. And when we actually separated, um, he was telling all these people in town. And we were from Athens, Georgia, so it's a very, very small town. He was telling all these people that me and Lemmy were having this affair and blah, blah, blah. So he, and I, and eight months later, he, he, he died. So, um, but I, when I was going through all of his things, his mother gave me all these things to go through. I found a letter from Lemmy, and like he had written him a letter saying, you know, um, I know at one point you really liked my band, and like, you know, just so that you know for the record, you know, Corey and I are really good friends. There's mutual love and respect there. We have, she did nothing but talk about how much she loved you, and you know, that I would never cross that line. I'm not that type of man, and, and, uh, you know, and it was just so cute because when you read the letter and it was like, I know at one time you liked me and my band and it's Levy and fucking Motorhead. It's like so bizarre. But he wrote this really beautiful letter to him and, you know, with the, with the, you know, with this, the red candle wax with the stamp on it, you know, on the back and sent it to him, you know, like that type of shit, man. You know, it's like he's a very, very honorable, generous, good, good man. He's very much... A complex emotional person but there is a kind of a, a distance in that he's purposefully put in between the do you know what I mean uh, and I think a lot of that is because well from from what he tells me is from his youth and how he's always had to look out for himself and he, and he's realized that 90% of the time the only person he can depend on is, is himself can you tell me about the people who have been most important in your life um, well, my mother, obviously, because she brought me up on her own, you know. And my granny for filling in during the day. I mean, they were really important. And they really dictated my outlook on things, you know, because being brought up by two women is different from having the big, heavy husband guy in the house, you know. So I never got the, like, let's go out and kill some small fairy animals, son, you know. Like, I never had that shit going on, you know. I just never missed a father because I never had one, you know. So I, I didn't care. He was just a miserable little dickhead with glasses. And all he ever did for me was walk out on me. I think I understand women a lot better than some guys do. Because women want the same things as guys do, they just don't want them for as long. Guys want the, the quick fuck in the alley all their lives, you know, whereas girls get tired of that pretty quick. You know, they want security. And security means you have to give up everything that might be a risk to their security, you know. Which is why I'm not married. <laughs> My dad once went out with a woman that he really fell in love with when he was very young. I mean, he must have been about 17. And this girl died uh, of a heroin overdose. And, you know, my dad is anti heroin. I mean, he, he, he will not have anything to do with someone who is on smack. But this girl, and it's, I think it's because of this girl, you know, because he really loved this girl. And she, he found her in the bathtub, you know. He found her dead in the tub. And, uh, and I think that he, as I, I, I can recall, he, he sat, on an, sat in an armchair for like three days. 
you know, he hasn't been able to really feel the same way about any other woman since since that woman. And um, that might be a part of why he is the way he is. I don't miss her anymore. You know, it's been a long time, 73. That's a long enough time. I can't even... You know, some of the time you can't even picture her face, but I can picture Susie, you know, she's all right. But, it's, you know, she died young and left a beautiful corpse, you know, and like when they do that, it's easier to think that they were the one. She probably wasn't, you know, because she was a... She was a mouthy little bitch, you know, as well, you know, but she was great, you know, at the same time. I mean, for a woman to be really interesting, she's got to be something of a bitch, surely, you know. If somebody's going yes to the all the time, yeah, that's no fucking good, is it? You want somebody to give you a run for your money, don't you? No relationship can survive a guy or a girl being in a rock band unless the other partner is also in a rock band. And even then it's difficult. Because you're away six months, of the, seven months of the year, you know. Nobody's going to stand for that. Either they want to go with you, which doesn't work, or they sit, sit at home and have affairs, or if they sit at home and take care of the kids, they build enough resentment because they think you're having a whale of a time on the road, you know. It can't work. It's one of those things, you have to make up your mind between rock and roll or your beloved one, and since sex only lasts for, what, half an hour at the very top, uh, rock and roll set lasts for an hour and a half, you know, so I think we got that one sorted out. Do you ever stop filming? Huh? Oh, really pity you haven't got smell on vision. Imagine the party, the, the, the party everybody's going to celebrate his life someday is just going to be uh, like a, a head of state. I think he'll be sorely missed throughout the world when he goes. But then I think the way it'll be, and I think the way he'd want it as well, he's no, there's not going to be many tears shed, but, ma but many what fucking great times we had. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be one of those. It's going to be a sad day, but also a, 
a day where everybody's going to get together and talk about the great fucking times that they had with that man and his music. I don't know how old he is, and I don't care. He could be a hundred years old. The fact that he's up there still doing it is absolute inspiration for us. We got nothing to complain about and everything to look forward to. And this is what I am. This is what I do. This is what I'm supposed to do. Right here. I'm supposed to be backstage waiting to go on, you know. If your life was a movie, how would you want it to end? It should end with the clap of thunder and me vanishing off the top of the mountain, leaving behind a plaque which says, fooled you again, you know. <laughs> Something along those lines. But of course, we can't afford the mountain, we can't afford the flash powder, and we can't get the cameras up the slope, right? So there you go. You can't have everything, can you? How would you put it? Any regrets? None. Life's too short. I'd like to say that you're one of the best fucking crowds we ever played for. Thank you. Don't forget us. We are Motorhead. And we play rock and roll.
Then I'll throw out another fucking year. Ah, that was a good, good one this year. Nice one. Fuck off back to your dressing room. It was alright this show, wasn't it? Yeah, Friday, oh. off, Greg. Yeah, give it a rest. Not in the elevator, yeah. give it a break, will give it? it a rest. Bye! <laughs> All right, go on. Oh, fuck off with the cameras, boy. Ah, uh, there they are. They've never worn you down, Russ. What's the matter with you, pal? A mouthful of broken teeth or what? <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers, man. Good to see you again.